have the ability to alternate between member and non-member pricing. Um, we have somebody here from Cumberland Farms, uh, representing Cumberland Farms, uh, the change in signage. So I'll let you go ahead and get into the details of the proposal. Um, but they are here seeking a certificate of appropriateness. Okay. I've already been in front of the zoning board, and that's when I found I realized that um, I needed to take the in front of you guys because of the zone that I'm in. Um, so that hearing, we just continue that so that we can get your comments, and then I'll go back in front of the zoning board. Um, basically, going <coughs> in front of the zoning board because the type of sign, LED, any type of LED sign um, is prohibited. So um, I need to seek a variance for that. Uh, basically, Cumberland Farms has started what they call a smart pay program. It's been around going on a year and a half, two years now. Um, the smart pay program allows the um, customer to get 10 cents off a gallon of gas if they are a member. Um, it's similar to you stop at shop where you have a card and you, um, the, st the Cumberland Farms one actually is connected to your debit card, so when you put your debit card in um, and your Cumberland Farms card, it automatically gives you that 10 cents off. Um, the, the price signs we have at this location are on the canopy. Those are what we call a scroller type sign. I don't know if you're familiar with um, what a scroller sign is. Um, it's basically, if you know what a scroll looks like in the old days and mm -hmm. you turn it sideways, there are three of these mechanisms inside that sign that have numbers on them and allow you know, the numbers to, you push a button, so this, the prices can be changed from within the, you know, within the store. Right now, the pump toppers are currently manual pump toppers. So every day, the people have to go out and they have to shut down the lanes with cones so that people can't come in and then they have to manually change those magnetic um, signs. So it's a two-phase thing. We want to make them LED, but while we're doing that, we also want to incorporate within that pump topper the smart pay member and the non-member prices. So um, I have a video that would show you, I don't know if you're familiar with the smart pay program, and then, you, you know, are you members of it or? No. You're not familiar with it? Familiar. <clears throat> so basically, um, a pump topper is required by the state. It's not required to be LED. Um, right now, we can change the prices, as I said, from in the store. We're just looking to be able to change the prices on the pump the same way. Um, you know, it's been a long winter and they've had to go out there and shut down lanes and it's icy and cold and whatever. So, um, this is just a short little video that will show you um, what the uh, well, we are, we are from the same one, the one on Main Street. Yeah, the, the no name. And a couple of pounds standard is to set the pump covers at eight seconds. Um, they can be changed from zero to 60 seconds. We feel anything over 30 seconds kind of defeats the purpose of, you know, being able to get the person to say, why is that doing that and everything. And we also, um, um, the standard brightness that Cumberland Farms sets all their LED price signs. If 10 is the brightest, they normally set theirs at six. We can reduce it down to two or three, anything below that would just keep burning up the, the, you know, the LED. So for instance, if we set it at the standard six and they thought it was too bright. Um, another thing is the way the gas station is located, it's, you know, it's not on, it's a sale street, you've got to kind of cut off and then there's another road mm -hmm. there. So it's, it's not like it's the main road where people are coming by and the way the pump top is out there inside the dispenser and the way the pumps are located, you really can't see them, you know what I mean? It's, it's not like it's going to be a distraction where if it was a sign out on the roadway, you know what I mean? And we do have a film that we can put over to even make them less bright. I've been doing these he hearings, you know, for like a year and a half, so we're learning from the town what they want to see and what, you know, is something that will help them to approve them. To do for you. Uh, I know how they work. So this is set at like 17 seconds. So um, you know it's it is an LED sign. Um, you know it's not by any means flashing <coughs> or meant to be a distraction. Um, pump toppers are mainly for the people at the pump. They're not meant to be seen from the roadway. They're roughly two square feet. 
Um, it'll be the same size as the magnetic one that's there. Um, the power comes from the pump itself, so they, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes I have to get a sign permit, other times it's just an electrical permit. It's, you know, it depends what town, the town wants. <clears throat> Do you have any questions for me? Um. I'm just trying to find all my notes because this is the old okay. stuff. I mean, one of the questions, the um, if it is not um, intended as, a, as an advertisement, in other words, if it's something that's only for somebody sitting at the pump, they, they already know whether they're a member or a non-member. Well, not everybody. No, I mean, I well, know, I'm just I know that I'm not a member. <coughs> okay. <laughs> so the price that I'm going to pay is is the the regular price, and if I pulled up to the pump and stick my my card in and it says you're a member, then it's perfectly reasonable for it to change to the to the member price at that point. But it's not obvious why it needs to change on a continuous basis, because except as an advertising gimmick, which is the kind of thing that we're trying to minimize. Right, and um, the normal way Cumberland Farms does is normally has it on the, you know, the pylon sign itself, um, and, you know, that is more of a distraction. We're not trying to put that type of sign up. Um, and, you know, if we also at least would like the LED pump toppers one way or the other, whether they say smart pay or not. Um, yeah, well, the, the thing is that I have no particular uh, objection to the LED, you know, that's, that's the, t the sign technology, but the uh, flashing or, or changing, using it as an advertising mechanism is the thing that we're trying to minimize. But it really just says smart pay member, non-member, so it's not like it's ever going to say, you know, cup of coffee, 99 cents, it's not going to be that type of sign, it'll only be for the prices and to inform them of the different two different prices. Okay. <laughs> yes. So the, the gas station on the corner of Main and South, that has six pumps, I think at least, and pump toppers. And none of them pump, none of them pulse at the same rate. So you've got a video of one sign blinking, but that, those pump at random rates, so you get this Christmas tree effect. And so it's very distracting. I know they're not moving very quickly, but that's 25 characters that could potentially change on two sides. So it's, I know that the variance requests. They're not says, supposed to change at different times, and if they are, but they do. Something wrong. They, I think that's a Cumberland Farms too, isn't it? I, or is that seven, six eleven? That's not a company. It's a mu farms. mutual. Six eleven. Once upon a time, was that's Cumberland right. Farms, but no longer. Well, yeah. there's there's pump, there's change at different rates, so all six pumps are changing at different times, and I don't know that there's any guarantee that they would change at the same time. But it's supposed to be normally, if say the sign you had the sign here and then the pump toppers, the sign would change, and about three seconds later the pump toppers would change. So they work simultaneously. Now they're just they're all going to work at the same time. They're not going to. Flicker and flash. But, but I don't pump, know. That. I think what he's saying, <laughs> right, is pump one and pump. No, I understand what six. he's saying. Okay. But I don't, as far as I know, that's not how they work. They all work. You would you would think that they'd be signaled from one location, but I'm telling you what's happening on the pump toppers I've seen, and the ones I've seen do not sync. So that's a concern because it. I know it's six signs or six tops, but it's double sided, 25 characters. Where, where is that? Gas station? Uh, South South Street and Main Street. Right across from Calarisos. At the top of Main, right before you hit the highway. And again, so if we're talking about let's let's go into fantasy land. A dollar ninety nine for gas, <laughs> and the change is ten cents. All twenty five characters change. Not just the zero five, you know, zero zero. It's, mm -hmm. it's all twenty five from the smart pay member to non member to all of the digits in the pricing on all three prices. Right, but I mean you saw how that was seventeen seconds, how long that was it, 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 and no one's gonna <coughs> see it you know what I mean? You don't even see it change, you don't even notice it changed. It just is very I notice subtle. it I notice it on that station. And again, well, no, I'm gonna, I'll go by there and see, here's the thing. So it's 17 seconds. Let's say it's 17 seconds. 
this pump is pulsing at 17 seconds, but this one is pulsing at some interval between that 17 seconds, and there's 12 signs that can do that. I know, that, that's not how it's supposed to work, and that's not how a couple <laughs> of farms has it working, so I, don't, I, I can only answer for them. Because that would be a pain in the butt, and then, you know what I mean, I, that's... <laughs> yeah, I mean, the thing They're all supposed to work <coughs> simultaneously, as far as I know. You know, I, I go to the, to the shell because I use my stop and shop gas rewards and when I put my gas rewards card in, the price changes because now it knows who I am and what and what rate I'm uh, using and, and you know what I'm pumping into the tank. Uh, so anything more than that is advertising. You're, you're also caught up in another piece of this, which concerns me. And, uh, Go ahead. Go ahead. I, yeah. The fact that it's in business B and that there's a claim that that this is the way the business is moving could imply, if they grant this variance, that the um, fish market could decide that the price of lobster has to be advertised, you know, at market price constantly. And so now you're going to have sale prices of some good, some market, some marketable item that's changing with the market that could be changing. And we don't allow scrolling signs or lit signs like that in business B. So what guarantee do I have that the ZBA, uh, Z, the zoning board, is not going to start granting variances to other businesses who claim that this is the industry standard? We're letting the industry decide what our signage standard should be. That's my bigger concern. I know it's a particular site of business A, uh, of business B. You know, it's sort of on that little offshoot of it, but that's yeah, a concern. It appears to have all different similar businesses in, around it. But they don't have signage like this. They're not. Um, no, I didn't say. They're restaurants. I'm, I'm saying it's not residential, and you know what I mean, where it would be a distraction. No, it's retail, but it's um, <coughs> but it's certainly not um, strip mall. But but it is across the street from residential, I mean, you you can the, there's a couple of houses that over on the other side of the street there is a fence, but the their windows are higher than the the fence level. So well, the whole the, the whole. The neighborhood behind Goddard School is well. No, e uh, even across, the yeah, yeah okay. across the the other the other direction. <coughs> um, that would have a view of those couple, um, mm -hmm. you know, the the ones that face that face the road. Um, so, why wouldn't it be easier to actually have the your um, scrolling sign have the two prices on it. Not changing, but fixed. Because I think that's what a lot of the cash and credit gas stations do. They'll have the large price for regular uh, cash and then credit, or vice versa, actually. Right? The lower price is the bigger number. And those are fixed, and so you see that there's a, a discount for something that's fixed. It's not flashing. It would change daily, I guess, if the price changes daily. Because that, it's seen quickly. You don't really see the price on the pump topper. But then you'd have six. Well, why do you have to have they, six? Well, they're not yeah. going to do it with the scroll. They won't do it with a scroll type sign. If it was LED, they've had LED, regular LED smart price. Right. That's our, that's our last option to have a deal. But as far as the pump toppers, then you're going to have double set of pump toppers. They would just put the LED without the smart pay. We would, we would at least like to, you know, at least get the LED. Um, you know, smart pay is just a, you know, a thing that they currently have, and um, they're doing it at all these stores, and they wanted to incorporate it into the property. <coughs> well, administratively, where are we on this? They want um, from us a certificate of appropriate. The, uh, Jeff did submit some comments I included in your dust packets, page four, for this evening. Um, he was questioning whether or not this really had any jurisdiction under CPDC since they are seeking a variance. <coughs> It is interesting 
because it's my understanding that the certificate of appropriateness should not be issued if it doesn't comply with zoning. So it's a chicken before the egg sort of um, issue. That's true. Um, we have done it in the past. So when they sought a variance for the canopy, we, CPDC did issue a certificate of appropriateness um, for that, even though it did go before the zoning board. Thoughts? Um, so, um, Jiffy, is it Jiffy Lube? <coughs> Jiffy Lube had a um, sign, right, has a LED sign that was um, issued that was um, it, allowed. Somehow. It was allowed somehow I, it, um, well, through it was, a. It was allowed with a, with a fixed. Uh, well, content, so, I I, no. It, well, when it was first put up, it, it changed. And. Um, and I know that that went through a lot of administrative review and um, uh, went to the ZBA and then <clears throat> and then uh, we had town council I thought um, in on that as well and I guess my question is do you happen to know because I thought there was a I thought there was something established on how how often they could change their sign they did I believe theirs was I want to say limited to four times a day. I think that was the cap that was written into, you know, I don't even think it was written into their decision. I think it no, was. No, because their decision came, it came, yeah, it, it came afterwards. That somehow it was, it was agreed that it wouldn't I, change. I think it came into a decision on something else within well, there. when they wanted the variance for the double signs. Yes. On both on yeah. Street. Yeah. Right. Yeah, they were definitely capped and maybe four <coughs> times a day. And that was a concession to a sign that went up without this without is, real permission. This is what yeah. a standard LED pop top would look like? And that would change once a day? I guess um, my thought is there <laughs> uh, there was already this discussion in town related to signs relating to, to uh, LED signs and that was the conclusion is you know not that it's okay but w when forced changing four times a day was the sort of the maximum that was um, acceptable not once every mm -hmm. um, eight to twelve seconds so I'm not sure why because this is a price on a gas pump that it would that be different that yeah. would it, that change, that would be a, any different no I agree I agree I don't think it should be changing you know as I as I mentioned before if it's you know, if it changes because somebody has put in their smart pay member card in the what you're displaying is the uh, the price of what is being vended. I sure. mean that's not unreasonable. Uh, not perfect, but that's the, the non-LED signs like the pumps at the the shell do that. You know they have the oh yeah yeah the, the uh, yeah. on the pump display of the price that you're actually paying per gallon. Well, that'll happen on the pump anyways. On the pump displays, you'll see the price you're paying when you select the grade. And you'll, you know, where it scrolls the gallons and okay. cost. It'll flash you the price you're paying, just like the Stop and Shop card gives you the discounted price once you punch it in. Right. That wouldn't change the uh, topper at all. Wouldn't have to change the topper. Yeah. We don't have any any lighting type values on that setting that you're talking about from zero to ten. What the, what that really means for lumens? It's hard, it's hard to tell you that because every canopy they're under is different. I might have a canopy with two pumps and four lights under it. You know what I mean? So that I don't think it's going to be 
any brighter than what is already shining there with the canopy. You know what I'm saying? <coughs> no, I don't think it'll add. I don't think it'll add right, to it the. Right, it won't add to the value of lighting from the canopy. I'm just thinking about the brightness of the sign. And the dimmest number you said that you could put it at was what number? Three? Like three, because otherwise they, they, you know, they would just stop burning out and they'd have to change them all the time. Really? <coughs> but there also is a difference um, of uh, on something like this with LEDs of what you can read f in during daytime during bright sunlight and and at night too correct so you know if if it done I'm going to say appropriately I mean if it was all timed out right that you'd have a brighter um, uh, they're brighter during the day. brighter the, they so, dim it they dim at night they so right. so you're talking about the nighttime. Right. Setting, not necessarily, right, but they turn I mean, it up during, during the day. day. You really can't right. see it. It's when it gets dark. And they'll only be on the hours of the store opening. <coughs> Isn't that open? Is that one open 24 it's, hours? It's, I, I don't no. think it is. It's not 24 no. hours. I think it closes. This gas station? No. I have written down it's not 24 hours. And it doesn't have diesel, so, so the, only, the only 24 hours, I think, the Walker's Brook Shell is real. It's asking to, to close. <laughs> <laughs> right. The once upon a time, 24 hour. Well, that that um, application was clarified to me last week that it's just the Dunkin' Donuts yeah. aspect of the site that's looking to reduce their hours. Oh, okay. Anybody object to this being LED lights? My understanding of a variance is that you have to meet all four of the criteria that are listed. So I don't see how you meet any of them, but I don't know what the ZBA will decide. I mean, in the first paragraph, you actually say site is not an issue, site constraints. Well, I mean, yeah. It, it what does the site have to do? No, I understand yeah. exactly, but, but I mean that's one of the criteria you're supposed to meet and the site circumstances do not <coughs> impact the, the sign. It'd be interesting to see how they rule on that. Hasn't stopped Yeah, I mean past. I've been doing them and doing all right so far, so we'll yeah. see what happens. And I have gotten them approved where they say no to the smart paint but give me the LED. <laughs> the my tendency would be to uh, suggest a uh, condition of you know un disallow the changing the regular changing, but allow the LED. I'm not sure how to. I would write it, uh, pump top or shell be non-flashing, non-changing. Static. Static. Put all three in there. So what's the enforcement? How do we enforce that? Because they'll, well, you're saying these don't have the technology to right, do that. Right, yeah, they, would, they wouldn't buy the other one because it's more expensive. They'll, you know what I mean? They'll just put the one that was approved in. I would say the pump pump topper shall be non-flashing, non-changing, static display. We call it a standard pump topper if you want to say standard. Standard <coughs> LED. Standard LED pump topper. Standard LED pump topper shall be non non flashing, non non flashing static display. I don't want to say non changing because they can change every day. 
Actually, you could change up to four times a day if somebody were to enforce that. Well, the prices could change throughout the day, too. They, they, they normally, the they most do. they would change is twice a day to get that. I mean, if they're out there changing prices frequently. And, uh, Did you want to comment yeah. on the brightness, too, you said? Yeah, we could say that um, <coughs> the light level shall be set at, or the level, the light shall be set at level number three out of ten. That's what you said it was. Nighttime. Mm -hmm. What that does is that it's just the bulb gets smaller. The dot, the red dot just decreases in size. Okay. One thing I'd like to change in the findings, though, because I want CBA to understand this, yeah. it's the first finding where it says the applicant is seeking to seeking approval to replace the manual pump topper with six new double-sided uh. pump toppers, LED pump toppers. Okay. Yep. So isn't this isn't um, this cer certificate of appropriateness um, only valid if condition? Oh, I'm sorry. Two or I three now, whatever it is, right? They have to relieve. They have to get approval from ZBA. The applicant shall receive relief from ZBA prior to submitting to the building inspector. So what this does is if they get relief from ZBA for what we just said is appropriate, they don't have to come back here yeah. to get their permit. Yeah, I think the last time we did it, we did it the other way around. They got their relief, and then they got the certificate of appropriateness. I, 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 um, I actually think that this, uh, this way is more appropriate. Mm -hmm. Because then they know exactly what it is they're providing relief and that was their comment yeah. that they wanted you to say it before yeah. they. I guess that the challenge is, is they they could have just appeal this decision with the relief because we are issuing a certificate of appropriateness on something that doesn't quite it's have conditional, I know, it's, yeah. kind it's of, conditional it's, yeah yeah um, we should add this material to the list of materials I don't think it just this was not included in no, the other packet. Do you want one? Uh, yes, please. I guess is it a, is it appropriate in this um, I, 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 that the issuing of this certificate of appropriateness, I, I in my mind, has no we're not this provides no opinion. To, uh, regarding um, their um, application to ZBA for a leaf. Right. I, if, yeah. if I vote for this, this does not say that I am anticipating or providing any opinion on whether they should provide relief or not. Right. And do you I, want to? What's that? Do you want to? Um, I'm not sure a certificate of appropriate is the appropriate place to provide that <laughs> opinion, but I want to make sure that I, I would like to make sure that this certificate of appropriate isn't um, taken is not intended uh, is to not intended right. to um, to encourage right. provide and be interpreted as an opinion. Right. Yeah, because this is worded to approve the sign application. Mm -hmm. We should probably modify that sentence. We would conditionally approve certificate of appropriateness, really. 
We're just approving the certificate of appropriateness. The certificate. The request for certificate of appropriateness. Yeah. Pending action by the ZBA. to approve the request for certificate of appropriateness from Cumberland Farms with the following conditions and pending action by the ZBA. Yep. that the CPDC uh, approve the certificate of appropriateness for the uh, pump copper sign at Cumberland Farms on Salem Street as amended. Second. All in favor? <coughs> Thank you. All right. Want to stop this? Um, yes. If you want to write on there, Nick, um, the non-flashing static display. He, he has. Yeah, so I wrote light level okay. set at number okay. light level set at number three, nighttime, and then non-flashing, non-changing static. Okay. Thank you. Display. let them understand that um, that's not a wholesale approval of LED light signs in uh, business B. Mm -hmm. This really is a special condition. Yeah. Would it be something that the board would want to write to them? Or acting chair of this meeting, we right, shoot an email. Yeah, we could do that I too. Which I can then forward to them. We just kept getting postponed. Everybody kept getting postponed there. Yeah, she's been trying to get on since <laughs> December, <January>. I think <laughs> she went. <laughs> so. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Since non winter, yes. Yeah. All right, so let's see what's next here. Minor mod for Ash Street. Okay? I can't find my. Next is a minor modification for 200 Ash Street Ravens Family Dental. So if you recall, there were some outstanding conditions in the original site plan decision approval for 200 Ash Street uh, related to a few things, primarily the landscaping. Uh, the applicant has come back with a few other changes as well to address some other concerns um, from, from staff. And we are looking, they're looking for um, approval of all those changes here tonight. We do have a uh, plan here that shows the proposed landscaping. There was a lot of discussion about the landscaping in front of the building. Um, this is what they've proposed, um, includes one tree here. Uh, this has been reviewed by the, the tree warden. He's okay with it. Um, there's some conduit here that was a little bit challenging, so they felt that this was the most appropriate location. Um, there's a few other changes to the site with the dumpster and some snow storage and a fence, and I'll, I'll let them go into detail um, more about uh, the changes. So um, Nancy's here. Yeah, I'll 
I am Nancy Tooney, the architect for the project, and I have Paul Carrigan, the contractor, who can answer questions. The um, major change, I don't know if you remember, you may, the original site plan had, um, you had insisted on having some kind of planting in front of the building. So because this is the property line and this is the town, the, um, oh, thank you. Very good. Um, there we go. You had requested that there be some landscaping here at the end of the handicapped access ramp. Uh, the difficulty with that is then no one can access the handicapped ramp very easily. I'm very concerned. This is a ramp that's used by mothers with strollers, with young kids, with walkers, not just wheelchairs. So <coughs> at the end of the ramp, you can imagine everybody running down that ramp and ending up in a bush. So the thought was that we don't do this, but we remove the pavement in front of the building and we plant a tree and some additional landscaping, whatever grass mainly, but whatever landscaping mm -hmm. we can put in there. And then that maintains the sidewalk so that they can get access to that ramp. Uh, it maintains driveway access to the ramp and it provides some landscaping relief in the front. So the town, uh, through George Zamborsi, agreed that cutting that asphalt was fine with them. Uh, the the um, tree that we're planting is a pear, uh, from, uh, Cleveland pear, or one of the pears that the tree warden has requested. This tree here is a very large tree, quite a big canopy over it that's remaining. Mm -hmm. So there's quite a bit of landscaping in there already that's going to stay. So that's the main change I think that you guys might remember from the original plan. The other change is that um, because of state regulations in terms of recycling, they now need two dumpsters according to their party removal. So the intent is that we have two dumpsters in this location. No one is parking there. This is a, a, a professional building. So the carting company comes in and backs up removes those dumpsters when there isn't anybody in the parking lot. This was the most efficient way that they found that they could use that dumpster location. Um, the conservation administrator has asked us to add additional bollards to make sure that the dumpsters don't get pushed back, which we uh, show on the plan. And then also the conservation administrator has been asking for some fencing in here to help define the snow storage removal or snow storage, so it doesn't go into the rain garden. So I think those were the main pieces. There was also uh, an updated uh, stormwater maintenance plan that there were some changes that were asked for. And um, I think that pretty much summarizes the changes from the original site plan that we were requesting. How do you access the dumpsters to throw stuff into them? If there's a car parked in that spot, can you open the door, the gate, to throw something away? Um, you can't access the dumpsters when there's cars there, but the dumpster company has been coming for the last probably 20 years at 6.30 or 7 in the morning, knowing that there's cars there. So they come early, they dump the dumpsters, and then they leave. And they actually do Burger King across the street at the same time. What about employees? Right, but how does the employee throw it away? Uh, throwing stuff away with the dumpsters there. They, it's usually at the end of the day. Uh, yeah, it's, it's end of the day, and um, they always accumulate the rubbish during the day, and they take the bags out and walk out and, and dump the dumps, dump the, the stuff into the containers. This is also employee parking on that side. So at the end of the day, no patients are really in the building and they're dumping it. And it's primarily um, paper goods because it's a dental office building. So it's not food, it's not something that is, that I would imagine most of it it's, is the it's paper. It's usually two white bags yeah. at the end of the day. Yeah. That's the end of the day. And our only change has been that they always use one container, but now the state regulations have asked if we would start recycling like we do at our homes. So they, they've given us a second container 
a, a smaller container for recycling, larger container for rubbish. And um, so that required us to make a, a larger fenced in area for the containers. And it's actually while we've been doing construction, we've had the containers on the left side of the building. Yeah. Um, <coughs> in the, the north parking lot, and it's been functioning fine. Uh, and like I said, they come early in the morning. They know that there's parking there, so they get the containers, dump them out, and get out of the way. So it's worked out well. Okay. <clears throat> um, I, this is great. This is exactly what we talked about. I think it was two different meetings or something, but that's um, exactly what we were um, looking for. I, I do I do have to chuckle a little bit in in that um, you know we this board was the one that um, really sort of pushed along on um, having that pavement um, uh, taken out in in a tree or so, something put in there but but yet then um, we the town also um, set this um, set this uh, up so that um, we wouldn't give you a um, certificate of occupancy unless you warranted the tree that you're going to put in the space that we sort of insisted that um, get you, you put. So I, 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 I apologize. It's, that's goofy. Um, <laughs> but it is what it is, I guess. I, I don't think that should be that, that big of a deal, but it's sort of odd. Uh, but other than that. I'm on. That's all good. <laughs> it's uh, it's outside the property line, right? But there's sidewalk between that and the street. I'm just trying yes. to think if a town truck comes in with a, if a town plow takes out the tree. Yeah. No, there's a sidewalk. And once so you have enough fix it. Yeah. There's um, there's curving. Yeah. Here, I should take the. Oh, sorry. Nope. You're fine. It's actually on a tree lawn, so the sidewalk okay. is between yeah. the street that's and right. the tree lawn. Okay. That's the curve yeah. for the street. Then that's the sidewalk, that's the tree lawn, and then there's another sidewalk yeah. on our property to yeah. reach the impact in this road. Hopefully the town will take out the tree. <laughs> I don't have any other issues. Yes. Yeah. Jesse, did you guys have anything else? No, we just we had kind of similar questions along the um, the dumpster. You know, it just seemed a little bit awkward to have it placed that way. But if they can get to it in the morning, it's you know it's going to be their issue. Um, and that was that was really about it. The tree warden did want the the warranty, um, and he's reviewed reviewed what they submitted, and he's okay with it. Okay. Okay. Uh, move that the CPDC determine that the uh, proposed modification at 200 Ash Street, the Raven Family Dental, is, an, is a minor modification. Second. All in favor? Move that the CPDC approve the minor modification at 200 Ash Street for the Raven Family Dental as amended. Second. All in favor? Thanks. Thank you. Okay, what do we have? We have a subdivision bond <coughs> request for Sailor Tom's Lake. Yeah. Yes, so. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the work is 99% complete on the subdivision with the exception of one tree that needed to be replaced. Uh, one tree that needed to be replaced valued at $500. So um, he can't obviously plant it right now. Um, so he just requested that we reduce the bond down to 500 and then after the tree is replaced, it will be inspected by the tree warden, and we can move forward with the certificate of completion for the subdivision with the goal of having it be accepted in November town meeting. Okay. Uh, the town engineer did supply a memo. He's, he's fine with 
with going down to 500. Right now we're holding 5,000. Any discussion? Move that the CPDC uh, bond amount for the Sailor Tom's Way subdivision at 175 Franklin Street to $500 as recommended by the town engineer. Second. All in favor? And so shall it be. Ahead of schedule. Okay. So these uh, reviewing this zoning language, these are not public hearings yet. These are just workshops. Correct. So we can start. So, yes, they are workshops. We do not have, have the public hearings until this summer. Um, I don't know if any of you personally know Chuck, our conservation administrator, Charles, Chuck Tyrone. He is here. Um, he wanted to participate in the review of the planned residential development. Uh, so I don't know if the on the agenda is the next item so um, in your packets though I did include on page 36 Jeff Hansen did provide some comment so in the document on page 36 we have Jeff's comments my comments and I believe Chuck's comments are also in here okay do we have to pay attention to the timing is the agenda when it says we're ahead of the agenda well, that's why I asked it's not a public hearing it's a, okay. it's a workshop yeah so that one was um, originally sent out in your packets starting on page 36 includes Jeff's hand Jeff Hansen's that he sent me earlier today so we can work off of Jeff's comments if you want so it includes Jeff's my comments some Zach comments left over um, and as well as some comments from Chuck. So this draft was originally worked on by the consultant and the zoning advisory committee. They got to a point where they were, you know, pretty well comfortable with it and were going to put it back to the CPDC for mm -hmm. some final review, but at that point it became not a priority we had reprioritized what we were going with at uh, at town meeting so this is this is where we we stand with with this current draft okay uh, I thought last time we met George you were going to do some work on right. this I have done some analysis on I'm on the, the BUD not the PRD okay the no. BUD. all right but I showed that today because I have, I have some findings about the structure of the BUD media uh, I can be a little helpful. Uh, one thing that I see immediately is that almost all the definitions under on the first page. And we're talking about the PUD the or the PRD? The PRD, the PRD okay. PRD definitions. Yep. Nice developer, existing, FAR, height, inclusion. There are also definitions under BUD, more or less. Mm -hmm. There are also definitions. And the smart growth. So that is like a very easy check to make sure that when we talk about FAR, we mean the same thing. And I think that's one of the black and white things. Well, commonly understood to be one thing, FAR. We don't need to define it. Well, the, the, the note. I mean, that we have he, the marginal note that we have is, is I think, the where we left things is the consolidate the dis, the definitions uh, in section two, and therefore basically remove the ones that are here in four point ten point two point one. Yeah, I think that's the ultimate goal. That's that's the goal because the I mean, what's here is is a little bit, in some cases, inconsistent, a little bit, um, in, you know, improperly formatted. Well, it's likely then that they vary somewhat between those three sections George me mentioned, right? Between mm -hmm. PRD, PUD, and Smart Growth, there could be some variances in what they are. So if and when we consolidate them, we'll have to make sure that we we don't lose the meaning that was intended in any particular one. 
right. and eliminate all the redundancy. If, you know, if, if, there was, if there was intended to be a difference, yeah. it's not clear that there uh, ever I, was intended I, to be I a difference. Maybe, maybe like some uh, bad gymnastics around the world <laughs> that I don't make, but you know, these are pretty well-defined planning terms. I would be surprised if there is like a, you know, a difference uh, at the core of the concept. You know, it yeah. So that's like a mini task for someone okay. to take on smart growth, PUD and PRD, vis-a-vis -vis the main definitions. I, I, I thought that we, um, maybe a year ago, <laughs> or at least it feels like a year ago, Jesse had done that. And I, I don't know about these definitions, um, but I do think it, it may have been in terms of height and I think for our <coughs> ratio that we did see um, uh, some changes, some differences that were substantive to the way the outcome of how they were used in that section. So, and I think these were some of the ones that we ended up punting on. Um, so before anyone goes and spends much time, probably makes sense to go back and dig out all that work that was done beforehand. A year. So just to close the loop here, I think that the definition should be one and the application or let's say how some of the aspects of, of um, measurement or so how this definition applies, that should be particular to, to the district. But the definition should be one. If we have to make it a little bit more neutral to have one definition, to make it friendly for even for more things that are going to come, so that they can go and look at that for you know, other amendments in the future. Maybe we can twist or say, if we're like in this particular district, FAR will also mean X, Y, Z. You know, if there is something yep. like this, for yep. example. Um, the other thing uh, I noted is, is, again, on the first page, there is like, at the middle, there is a 4, 10, 2. Um, this is about the, uh, how, the, how this overlay applies. And I'm wondering if that's also another general comment. Like, we have many overlays. Um, for, for example, for any land subject to a PRD overlay district, a developer may choose to conform either to the zoning regs which cover the underlying districts or the PRD overlay regulations and goes on. I mean, this is a very standard definition of overlay districts. Shouldn't that, doesn't this um, become another, like a, one of those, I don't even know how to name it, like a super concept, like a concept about all overlays, for example. And there is place uh, about, uh, there is place for this, I believe. David, is it uh, section four, where we first mention uh, overlay districts in the main zoning bible? Uh, let's see. Since we have a fresh, freshly printed, newly approved. I, I apologize if my, if my teeth are digging deeper, just making these kind of comments. Because the, the last part, and hopefully the last is the next phase, which is about the special permit, mm -hmm. which again, <laughs> again falls into some. Standard, standardization of what these terms mean. So a special permit for PRD and a special permit for PUD are different. But what is a special permit? What is the, per the special permit includes a certain process. Now granted, the PUD is a little heavier because it involves the town meeting. So that could be something specific that we take out and tweak at the PUD language. But the special permit process is already indicated in the, I, for, I forget the chapter, the I think it's administrative chapter in when we talk about um, the permitting process, we'll have site plan or by right or by, by a minor site plan. We do have a, a section in the new bylaw that describes the criteria that the special permit granting authority is to consider the application. Um, but I think as it relates to the PRD, it, it sets forth the specific process, not necessarily the criteria. Perhaps.
perhaps is, this is a little bit more difficult to tackle, you know. How does a special process vary among different districts or, you know? Um, okay, what are we trying to accomplish at the moment? Is the trying to throw a curveball, basically, and I think it landed. <laughs> or are we just hitting on some of the sort of bigger yeah. issues to consider when we're reading this? I find myself turning pragmatic in some of this stuff. The if you look at the what's in front of us, we're in the context of the new definitions. Basically, we can probably just strike in this entirety this 410221 because we have all of the definitions um, in the new uh, zoning bylaw. All of them? Yes. Inclusionary housing? I don't see site. We don't have site. I don't know if it's necessary, but. Um, Moderately priced housing? Uh, we don't. We don't have moderately priced housing. I think we have, a, do we have affordable housing. Is that broken down? Inclusionary is not in there. Affordable is not either. Okay, so at the very least, anything that's defined in the definitions could be struck from this section. And then that's an easy change. If we found that the other changes to the definitions within the section were more complex for some reason, then we could leave them where they are. Yeah, I think a lot of these could be, if they're not already pulled out to section two, I think they could be easily pulled out to section two. We, I know we did have a lot of discussion on the definition of floor area ratio um, and height. We talked a lot about that. Um, you know, floor area and so forth, I and mean, we've got all three floor area gross, floor area net, floor area ratio. Are all in the new. Yep. Yep. Uh, so is height. So I think structured parking is in there. I don't well. think height ever changes. I think that's always the same. Right. It's just that the two housing ones and site are not. And included. structured parking. And structured parking. And I think the definition of, of inclusionary housing and moderately priced housing is consistent with what we use for PUD. Um, I'd have to check the smart growth districts, but. <coughs> and I think the definition of developer and existing is. Mm -hmm. I, I As know. I say, this can be like a mini task for someone to take out. I mean, it's like a word search for, you know, to pull out all these things, have a, do a compare, and see what is different, and, you know. Yeah. It's not. There may be other locations where we, we talk about FAR, like a, you know, a mixed, mixed use or something. I, I yeah, I mean, we talk about it in almost every single section. I remember doing all that work. Yeah, so you have that work. Mm -hmm. And a year ago, the board punted to be resolved at a later date. The challenge, I think, came in where we kind of got stuck is the smart growth districts. Because we cannot change it. I don't think it's not that we can, can't change it, but it, it would take a lot to change it with the state to get that approval. And so I think at that, that point, it just got, okay, well, we're moving some up from some, some sections, we're leaving some in other sections. It just, 
got a little challenging on how to really mm -hmm. address it. So, well, I mean, this is this is a case where this particular um, paragraph, whatever you want to call it, isn't subject to those the the state constraints. Of right. So I think it'd be easier to pull these out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this we should just go ahead and fix. Mm -hmm. if, you mm -hmm. know, it's. Uh, and a fair amount of it is uh, administrative uh, uh, there are there's some still the questions on special permit procedures right which I think we pulled out uh, as a generic in the new law I don't know if we actually got that part of it approved Uh, it would be the new uh, administration. So under section section four point four is the special permit granting authority, and as a subsection to that, there are the um, the criteria. But that's not really the process. No, it doesn't. That's the criteria. Right. This process calls out, you know, the preliminary plan, the final plan. It's it's specific to. So the so process, the PRD process outline, and the PUD process outline, outline, not content, are almost identical. Are almost identical. Because okay. I, I did, I did try to break down that process. What are the steps? What is the meaning? You know, where is, when is time review? When is the final plan? What are the amendments, schedule, phasing, all of that? It's the same. Mm -hmm. So the the question I was I was attempting to get into first is the um, special permit procedure is specified to a certain degree by the state. Um, yes. Regulations, I believe. I, I, mean, don't, I, I don't think so because I think that that is. Um, um, there, are, there are constraints. I mean, yeah, I don't, I don't think the procedure is the constraint, though. I think there are things that you need to can and cannot do through mm -hmm. special permits, but I don't think it's. Like the, the framework yeah. of what can fall well, in. There's a, um, authority aspect of it, I thought it would be, or authorization, um, how long it, how long it endures, um, you know, what the requirements are and so on. So I thought, I thought there was some, um, AG guidance on that kind of thing. Uh, I mean, I mean, it, it may just be a hope. <laughs> but what I'm trying to get to is, it would be real nice if we had a, a more or less consistent special permit procedure for all special permits, or for the majority of special permits, and so that we could have a, a paragraph or. A, you know, chapter in the administrative right. Right. stuff. With the necessary tweaks, if something is heavy, like, like a PUDI, maybe something really big, so you know, under that distance, you may want to interject, you know, a milestone or like, you know, a second public hearing before the final plan, basically to make it work better to, to, for the interest of the town. Mm -hmm. But someone who doesn't know, let's say, that it's, you know, even if there's a developer who wants to come in and propose something and propose new zoning, they should know what the baseline, the baseline special process is, right? Like right. we dealt with that thing, you know, not then, eight years ago at the uh, Addison Wesley, where they had to come in with zoning out of nothing. And we were struggling, you know, day, you know, meeting after meeting up about writing zoning from nothing. So mm -hmm. having a special permit, a generic, I think would help the town. I, I guess I, I would say that there's uh, there's the, uh, getting a special permit under a planned development is really a, is a is a different 
is a, is a different process on purpose than a special permit for you know an adult use or there's all these uses that have special permits and and, and that's a different process it's a much simpler process on purpose um, than it is the these planned developments so I I don't I, I think we should be careful about lumping I mean there's all special permits into one process because they, they do have um, they do have some differences because there's a lot of special permits just on use and you don't want to set up the same sort of preliminary plan and uh, I you think know. we're talking about so special permit for it, overlays as long as that's yeah yeah, yeah, yeah I just want to make sure Not that we're for, you know, yeah. okay. for plan developments versus you know all these other special uses that are uh, special permits that are sort of there's a lot of them in there that are just mm -hmm. on let special permit granting authority here are the criteria granted or not so just want to make sure we're talking about mm -hmm. the same thing so another head-to-head -head comparison between PRD and PUD would be the special permit process we talked about definition going the definition exercise this could be another special permit exercise we don't obviously need to fit we have to figure out the delta at some point to discuss it, but we probably cannot do it now and have like a dot, you know, a word compare, figure out, figure out now the technicalities. That's like another like mini task. And maybe I don't know, Jess, is there another special process in another overlay district that we might have for oh, the of for? Of course, there is. <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, we have. Think. We have the. We have the PRD. We have the municipal use. Is that it? Is that special permit in, uh, under that different, a different process? Is that what you're? Yeah, I think so. Well, the other the other question is: is there an opportunity for? Um, Getting the, the nitty gritty details out of the zoning bylaw and into a, uh, guidelines and, and uh, you know the separate document. Why well, just to, to approval. simplify the approval and revision process? Yeah. And, uh, I, I guess I do like when you're reading through here it's it um, it's pretty user friendly in the sense that okay once you figured out okay I'm going I'm gonna you know it's I'm in the PRD then you know but step once I mean it's it's all really laid out right here um, uh, which is you know which is good that's what I mean it's, that, that's good that's not to say that this step one two three four couldn't be you know you couldn't be directed someplace else so that it's all in in, in one place um, but I, I do like the the, the layout y yeah the clarity yeah I mean, I mean, the words aren't clear. Right. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. The words are not clear, no. but this uh, it seems like to me that the um, steps. Yeah. The difference between PRB and PUD is that sometimes some residents who may own more than your typical single family house may try to get together to figure out whether PRB is a good option for them, not necessarily hiring a developer. As opposed to, I mean, when you go PUD, you really need to have the developer mindset, the technical background, expertise, what have you. But for a PRD, which is, I believe, uh, what is it, one and a half acre is the threshold? I think 60,000 square feet. Right. It's not, you know, if you think about it, it's not very difficult for two or three neighbors to get together in some parts of town that are good for it and begin to think, hey, can we do that? What, you know, so I think the audience might be a little different for PRD. Mm -hmm. I, that was one thing that I noted so I, in 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 here is our recurring use of developer. 
the term developer, 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 and and I was thinking the same thing is. So These might, could be a contractor. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. The yeah. developer yeah. is not quite the right term. Who cares? Right, right. Uh -huh. it, it, especially in this case. Who well, but that you're developing the PRD. It's still a single PRD. It does say that if it's made up of multiple parties, that all parties have to sign on. All right? Did right. I read that in here? You have to be identified, yes. Right. So they have to act as one entity. Yeah, yeah, we, we just have an attorney. Re replace the word developer always. with proponent. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, then we need a definition for that. I don't want to get hung up on definitions again. Yes. yes. I feel we make problems when this So we want to consider the term developer either by expanding on it or changing it. Okay. What else, George? Did you have anything else? Well, I was a little bit, I mean, one of the things that struck me as a little bit confusing was the uh, 41033 on the preliminary plan versus the 41338, I guess it is, uh, Final plan, and both of which have this developer shall ensure that two copies are of X are available, remain available in the town clerk's office during the uh, during the uh, special permit process. It sounds like you, and, and I'm not sure what. Does that mean that you have to maintain both the preliminary plan and the final plan so that people can compare them, or what's what's being required here? Well, it's at two different times, right? I mean, during the preliminary plan review portion of it, those plans are available. Well, yeah. but it says both of them say during the special permit process. Right. At some point, the final plans will come along. Everything should be there because somebody may want to look back to that preliminary plan to see what changed or how it changed. Yeah, we generally keep, um, maybe not at the counter at the same time, but we keep the preliminary plan and the final plan. So if, so, so if we're at the final plan stage and somebody wanted to see the preliminary plan, we would, if it wasn't already at the counter, we would dig it out of the file so that they could look at it. And I'm not sure why my comments aren't showing up, but I didn't, we may want to change that from the town clerk's office to the community services office, yeah, just I because that that's somewhere else. Yeah. Great. Um, yeah. strange. And actually, some of Chuck's weren't showing up in Jeff's comments either. I'm just realizing that. Chuck, did you bring your own comments? I have them I have on comments that. here. I just printed them out. Um, most of my comments have to do with uh, when I reviewed this, um, certain words where you were keying in on the Wetlands Protection Act and not reading Wetlands Protection Bylaw. Mm. So I asked that it was a, instead of an or, you would put in an and, Saw that. something like that. The bylaw was the wrong number. And then implementing this, I didn't understand um, how you worked in the riverfront protection area, which I don't think is mentioned in here at all. So I didn't know when this was originally written, but the Riverfront Act came into effect in 96. So Chuck's comments do show up on the, um, the second version starting on page. Uh, it starts at 410. Uh, the, just the PRD is about it. 53 of your dust packet. Okay. 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 Yeah, that's what I was looking So, my recollection of the PRD language is it's developed in the 80s. And uh, when I was talking with Chuck, I'm not sure if that had, I, I'm not familiar with the Wetlands Protection Act or what has changed since then, but maybe at that point, riverfront 
was classified differently or not called out specifically as a resource area. I'm not sure. So um, that could have been why it was written the way it was. Well, the, the constraints, I think, were extended when the, uh, they recognized it in the, in the 90s, I guess it was. That's right. In 96, it became a 200-foot, um, it's not really a buffer zone, it's a resource area. Right. So, um, and I did notice in a couple sections that you defined a, a flagged wetland and then gave an additional 25 feet. Uh, to not um, to, to keep out of um, development. So that made me uh, wonder, you know, there, there might be some room to work in the front area also. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the basic hope or intent, if you will, is to acknowledge the overriding regulations uh, and without attempting to uh, contradict them mm -hmm. or, you know, without duplicating them either. <laughs> I think um, the only spot I saw that it would be clear is actually on the FAR, uh, which is part of the definitions. So if that was going to be changed or has been changed in the zoning bylaw definitions to my comment is that you remove um, as wetlands, uh, um, this document will cover the wetlands and the riverfront. So you have um, as wetlands in there and if you took that out and just continued on and then a little bit further it says uh, 131 section 40 and change the order and I think that would cover the Wetlands Protection Act, the riverfront area, and the town bylaw. I'm not sure if you could work that into uh, that one statement covering this whole um, planned unit development. Okay, I lost the pointer. Bottom of page 53. Bottom of 53. Yeah, okay. So it says areas at the very bottom. Well, I don't know how it was printed out, but it says areas classified as wetlands. And I'm suggesting you remove as wetlands. So areas classified in the general bylaw, chapter 131, section 40, which is the Wetlands Protection Act, or the Reading Wetlands Protection Bylaw, section 7.1, not 5.7. Mm -hmm. May not exceed 10% of the development of the parcel. That would take on, by just removing as wetlands, not only the wetland area, not only the BBW, but also the riverfront. So, um, um, tell me this, because I, I sort of understand this stuff, but not completely. In riverfront is not as restrictive as trying to build in BVW, right? I mean, you can, or am I wrong on that? I mean, well, they, they both have different criteria you have to um, follow. So 5,000 square feet in riverfront or 5,000 square feet in BVW may be the same, but the first 100 feet in the riverfront, uh, if it's undisturbed and wooded or wet, you couldn't touch, essentially. So that would that would end up being an issue. But it also has on top of that. It becomes quite complicated because on top of that, if it's if it's redevelopment, then you could use everything that's already been developed. Yeah, and I guess that's where I'm more familiar with is mm -hmm. that you know there's a lot of places where it's redevelopment within the riverfront area, um, and you're right. You're allowed to redevelop that. Where if it's in B, um, uh, BBW, it, it, it's almost by definition, it's not, well, yeah. it, more often than not, it's not redevelopable. So I guess I, I, what I'm, uh, I guess what I'd, I'd put out there is that by restricting, uh, by, by using the whole part of a parcel that's in riverfront area, 
um, there may be a lot of places in town that are within that 200 foot buffer but could be developed under the what under the the regulations but then if we include that in the in the percentages of how much you can do on your parcel it would really impact the develop developability of these particular parcels is that well, am i it's it's true when you look at the riverfront act and the wetlands protection act you say wow that's all restricted area and there's nothing i can do but when you you know drill down onto what we do here on the conservation commission there's some there's some typical rules that they they want to follow which is stay 35 feet away with any structure and that works both in the riverfront area and in the um, bbw area so you're already saying let's keep everyone 25 feet away in a certain section here so i i think that that kind of language could go in there and then deciding how far away you would have to be. Now, if it was redevelopment, you wouldn't, you really wouldn't get into the riverfront um, act too much at all. At right, all. I, I, I'm with you on that, but using the area, the riverfront area of your parcel to calculate F, your allowed FAR, um, doesn't, you, you're- No, it doesn't work. Yeah, that it. doesn't work. But yeah. Um, uh, or your ten, there's somewhere else in here where it was like 10% of... Um, 5,000 square feet or 10%. If that's you're talking about the riverfront. Um, uh, your residential density here, and, and you suggested putting in... Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm on page 61. Um, yep. Calculating your allowed residential density based in <laughs> on part of the... The, the amount of your property that's in riverfront area. So I, I, I think there's a, I think we just need to be careful about, because the river, riverfront area can be a whole lot bigger than the restrictions that are placed within that riverfront area. It, does that, and using that whole area as a way to calculate your allowed density on the portions of the parcel that you can develop on just start starts to screw um, screw up the calculations. But the tipping point is uh, if it's being developed already. Right. That is the differentiator. It, in the, I think that we need to, if we're going to use riverfront area, then we need to work that into if we're using calculations. Right. But, but why, why is that uh, unique in PRD and it's not applicable to every property? That you may that FAR applies. Like there are. It, it may be we just don't have it anywhere else. <laughs> that, but that's what I'm getting at. I mean, there, there, there are wetlands all over town. There may be other overlays. There may be so that is applicable outside of PRD. Mm -hmm. It's the intent of not lumping into your your calculated site area areas that you should not under the circumstances that we just yeah, discussed. Yeah. But that is not uh, like a really. I mean, the, I think ultimately you're going to end up getting a permit from the Conservation Commission for this development outside of this process here, um, outside of the PRD, whether you're in the riverfront or in the buffer zone. But what I see that's needed is what is that distance from top of bank for riverfront that they that you would you would hold sacred, just like the 25 foot, which is our zone of natural vegetation. So I read that in here, the 25 foot somewhere, you're gonna say that can't be part of the calculation. But what part of the riverfront is not gonna be part of the calculation either? It has to be something unless it's, it doesn't yes. have to be 200 feet, right. but it's yeah. Yeah. Yes. It's a quarter of the, of the buffer zone to the BBW. Is it a quarter of the riverfront? Who knows? I mean, it has to be looked at, but yeah. it should be something. Mm. We'll probably come to you to tell us, <laughs> you know, how can we establish that? <coughs> it depends on topography, too, because it's one thing to have like a very shallow creek, mm -hmm. another thing to have something very wide, like at uh, Coolidge, for example. Or, you know, how much water is there? So there must be, if there's a golden number, you probably have a better picture of what that should be based on the variations of river banks. 
Well, I don't want to talk for the commission, but I think that. Mission, but uh, I think that we we have this 35 foot area, and somewhere between 25 and 35 foot may be where the calculation should be, as long as it goes to the commission after the fact. This is just a calculation to get them through this process here. I don't well, the think way we're giving away anything. The way it's written, it does say as delineated by and approved by the conservation, as approved, delineated by the, an accredited scientist, specialist, and approved by the Conservation Commission. So, you know, I'm assuming that they would, you know, delineate where that riverfront area is. So, by by that, I would assume that they would look at the 200 foot and exclude that from. Right, but you have to, you yeah. have to remember this doesn't mention the riverfront at all. So that if we included yeah, the riverfront, include if we first. included the riverfront in this calculation, mm -hmm. then that would subtract from the developable area, which is enormous. It which is. is an enormous amount of property to exclude from your calculations on residential density if you don't put those caveats in there About that say, you know, okay, here's the 200 foot buffer. But we already know that this is developable and this is developable and this is redevelopable. And you know, it's really this area that's that's that has those restrictions on it. And you, you take that out of the calculation on um, on your residential density, or else where you're not going to be able to use, um, you, you know, because everything in, I, I, there's a lot of property in town that's within the 200 foot within a riverfront area. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't do it. I think we need to just be careful well, about Just to be clear, it. that second 100 foot of the 200 foot yeah. is usually considered pretty accessible and buildable by most commissions throughout the Commonwealth. So it's, so that's fine. We, we, should, we don't need to talk about it in this, you know, for this PRD. But getting closer to the top of bank <coughs> You know, maybe maybe a good point to have a discussion. Unless the board leaves the riverfront out as the, calcu uh, the part of the part density calculation, and leave it up to the conservation commission as to where the placement goes, whether it's redevelopment, whether it's not, where the actual development happens on the site, working within that density. We want to be predictable. What's the process? How do, when does he go to, when does the developer go to conservation versus come here? You know, are we setting up those scenarios again where we're chasing each other's tail trying to Based on things? this language, I read it as it has to be approved by the Conservation Commission so they at least have to get an AMRAD before they come to CPDC for the density. But there may be some very fundamental decisions when before the preliminary plan that are discussed here. You're saying this is like a programmatic, like the first base that they'll have to do that before they even begin to think no. about the preliminary plan? No, I don't think so. I, I, I think before using this language, a developer would want to know what their density what their density could be and to establish that that density they're going to need to know what the what the approved wetland line is conservation so they may have an idea maybe they have a scientist go out and they assume it's going to be approved by conservation they can maybe make those assumptions on what the density is and come to cbdc but the density won't be finalized until we have some sort of approved wetland delineation from the Conservation Commission. Mm -hmm. And that, that could happen That could happen at the beginning or during this process. And it doesn't have to be a full-fledged permit. Um, it could be as simple, yeah. as simple as doing a request for determination of applicability, which actually has yeah. that capability of approving a wetland line. Mm -hmm. But no wetland line is approved until the Conservation Commission puts a stamp on it, and then that's valid for three years. So wetlands professional, wetland scientist, uh, it doesn't matter. It needs to be approved by the Conservation Commission. Because the wetland line comes down to the width of professional judgment. 
there's no exact point. There can always be an argument to the left or right. Well, I think we should, we need to move on. Mm -hmm. um, it's important that we get the right um, Who's, who, flavor, if you want. <laughs> who decides the development redevelopment? Is that worked out? Through conservation, or is that something that's in a in a <coughs> front, in yeah. front area? Mm -hmm. um, it's. I just think it's obvious, but um, it's, it's not obvious. <laughs> I'm, so I'm, I'm, I'm working on a project right now that right. it's it, we've gone around in circles with a particular conservation commission of what's development and what's redevelopment. Well, I, it, it, in most cases, it yeah. probably is obvious. It's, so. <laughs> The old Who works it out if it's redevelopment or not? Um, the applicant comes in with uh, that checked off, and he's decided that it's redevelopment. Then through that process, the commission approves it or not. So during that conservation hearing, I guess it, it comes out. Yeah, I, you know, understanding what you guys want to do, as long as at the end of this, the commission can review these projects and the developer knows that. If, even if whatever the density he's getting may not um, actually be everything he can get because the commission will push back on that a bit so we get some sort of involvement at the end and you come up with um, that 25 foot for the BBW maybe there's a certain amount of which that we can do with the riverfront because there's no possible way that they would get close to 25 feet you know I think right now that a, um, a structure shouldn't be more than, in both, 35 feet away. And a developer can hardly, you know, pass the requirements for the variance. So, and then if, if that happened, all the developers would know um, what they needed to do and they could move forward without being, having too much conservation involved. So the location on the site, I think, I think that that all makes sense, and would, would I think it's the, the what I have the question is how do you calculate the density, the allowed density, um, with that uncertainty? Not where that density goes on the site and how close it can be to the different resource areas that happen to be on that site. So that's my. So if it's programmatic then maybe JC is right. It should be right up front to get it out of the way. Yes, yeah. Because I'm just trying to think this out. If if moving something like an area, say one and a half acre, if one of your lines is like five or maybe six or eight feet further in, that may mean a couple of units. Yeah. And that may make the project or break it. Absolutely. If, so, yeah. I mean, that's what we're talking about. More for you know for sixty thousand. So, I mean that's what it is. So we do want to have it up front, I guess. If if that's what yeah. we're talking about. Well, yeah. that's that's that that is how it. I mean that is how it's what written. Whether or not the developer sort of has some preliminary discussions with CPDC, nothing prevents them from doing that informally um, to talk about you know maybe other issues related to the site. But when it comes mm -hmm. to that, based on what has been drafted. The density will not be. We can't confirm compliance with zoning based on the for density until that line gets approved by the conservation commission. And it's just, I guess, whether or not we want to put a number on the. If we want to include riverfront, if we want to put a number on the riverfront, if we don't want to include it and have it placement get worked out through conservation I guess those are all questions we need to work through what else on this uh, page 60 we just touched on page 60 in the middle 
required inclusionary housing. I don't know if this is something to probably discuss out in a public hearing, but wouldn't we want to match something similar to a 40B here, which is what, is it 10%? 40 is 20%, 25%. We had another percentage. We had a 10% somewhere in another part. Maybe it was PUD. But was it the old mixed use? Like to never, never go below what our goal is, which is the 10% goal. What page, uh, page are you looking at? Uh, page 60 in the middle. 410, 4, 421. 4, 2, 1. says required inclusionary housing it, and then the, the verbiage says any development may provide affordable or moderately priced housing unit. It needs to be stated better obviously. I mean it's either be, it either is required or is not required. <laughs> it's if they want increased density they have to provide it. Going to that on page 63, where there is increased density, development intensity and height, I have a feeling this is written for a specific project that was looking for this. I just can't see that being the norm for every project to ask for an increase. I, mean, I don't know the history behind. Well, the, the, the working. Offer presumption with the PRD is that the for the entire parcel if you will for the project the number of units will not exceed the underlying zoning because if you're in S20 then it's the whatever the total parcel is divided by 20,000 square feet is the maximum number of units. Now you may put put them all in one corner in order to protect resource areas and, and you know this is the the concept of the cluster uh, cluster development. But what we have told town meeting on more than one occasion is that it, it basically it does not increase the density of the zoning district. So in, in, an, in an S20 district where you have a 20,000 square foot house, no. they stone 10 for square foot lot, <laughs> I'm sorry. There's a point for the assumption of 10, for 10, for 3 intensity of development, is there was a presumed FAR of 0 0.4 at the top of page 61. Okay. Which you would assume that would imply that there is on that 20,000 square foot lot there is an 8,000 square foot ho house. It could be, yeah. But that is not typical already. The footprints are not of that size. There may be some exception, well, but no, in but general. But 8,000 square feet is not footprint, it's total floor right. area. Even if you talk about two, four, you know, two stories of 4,000, that's like a, this, this, this is not ready. It's probably twice as big as red. If you look at the, you if know, you look at the, the yeah, new, but the now new structure defined includes pool and includes sport court, and so suddenly, um, suddenly, that's not all that big. I mean, it's big, but it's not um, completely out of character. Yeah, we think we're in the four to six thousand square foot. Yeah, and then. You, know, you look at the houses they just built on uh, Curtis Street. You know, nine hundred and ten thousand dollar house. It's not. 
that's a building. A bad house too. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so on a on a sixty thousand with a point four FAR, we have about twenty four thousand square feet to build for three U three units. Mm -hmm. gonna do th that's not gonna work in any. Yeah, not that the, the math doesn't work, you know, to do it. It seems high. We should yeah. check it. Yeah. Well, actually, it's crossed out. Um, it's yeah, it was it was the original language which has been crossed out. Although there was a restriction of twenty five percent maximum coverage. Right, but you can go around that marginally. Just need to look at that density. Yes. Yeah. But it makes sense. Perhaps that's a reason why this has not been used. <coughs> Even on an S10 district, then, on an S10 district, you would only be able to build six units maximum if you go with 60,000. If we ever had any. You're talking <laughs> using, yeah. the existing, using the existing you language. You have a density restriction and not yeah. uh, something else. Because the, the, the new language is just based on the, uh, the ratio of the all these factors taken out versus what's left over, right? It's dividing the net acreage by a single lot in the underlying district. This is coming from proposed by CP? This, uh, no, that is some comments that Chuck had. Um, this language was proposed, I think, by our consultant. Originally. CP? Yes. I thought you said CT. Yeah. I'm, I'm reading it. So, that's weird. <coughs> oh, okay. yeah. Anything else on this that we want to address tonight? We'll move on to the next piece. I'm in favor of moving on. We're gonna. So we plan to come back to this on um, next <coughs> time on the sixth. Okay. <coughs> um, so as far as action items on, on the language. <coughs> Um, we talked about the term developer, maybe changing that to proponent. Um, <coughs> clean up the definitions. And then that's sort of where we left it. We'll need to. I think there's a question of whether we keep the structure of the, um, of the process in here or whether we can pull it out so that whether the PUD and the PRD and there's a place to put it um, so it consolidate all the plan development processes in one place mm -hmm. in it in sort of an upfront plan development <coughs> process section. We will know we will know after the next meeting <coughs> how, how that can happen. We don't we just don't know right. I haven't run the comparison yet. <coughs> and then how do we want to tackle the issue of riverfront area? Included. <laughs> if we include it, though, without defining, I mean, that's 200, the riverfront area is 200 feet. Like John mentioned, that would take up a, a lot. The 
guys aren't uh, taking into consideration the entire buffer zone at the BBW. So I don't think that's a question to include all of it. Yeah, which we so, could reduce So, yeah, it. and I think that's what we would right. need some help on is how to define, how do, you, how do you define the appropriate amount of the riverfront area to include, to exclude from, um, from the density calculation? You know, um, I think that's the, the, that's the question at hand mm -hmm. that we need your help with. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's potentially the, the simplifying thing is to remove the details from here and basically point to the experts. But you need to give the criteria, right? So that people who walk out in the property and they're trying to get a feel, am I going to do this? Am I not going to yeah. do this? At the yeah. birth of the project, they need to know something. Chuck, right? where do we mention the uh, 25 feet? For your wetland for the BW? C1 on page well, 10, um, a, a limitation of ownership, 10, 4, 10, 4, 4. Let's see if they are, and where else did I, I saw it someplace else too. The open space calculation. Uh, But now I'm starting to question whether or not in that language for the density, we don't specify 25 feet, we say wetland. In the ownership we do. So we're just talking the actual wetland line, BBW line. Mm. Mm. It says well, and it's not necessarily their buffer zones. Did you guys see it? Yeah, I just found it. <laughs> mentioned twice in the section you mentioned. Is that what you were thinking? What's that? I said, it is, were you thinking yeah. it's mentioned twice here in 41044? Four, four. Yeah. Is that why you thought you saw it twice? Uh, maybe, maybe. And you're right, like in the calculation at um, FAR, it's it's not the 25 feet. It's just it's it's just wetlands. It have a slopes. Um, no space should be considered usable if a slope is greater than 10 percent. Yeah, basically, we need to tighten up the references to it. Uh, I think wetland makes sense for BBW because that's, that's a line and you're excluding that from your calculation of density. Whether or not you can actually put your structure within their buffer zone, that's up to them. That's a different question, yeah. And so with the riverfront area, it's, I guess, a, what is the, what is the delineate? Top of bank? Top of bank. And if, I mean, what you just asked, Probably great questions. We wouldn't allow any developer to put a structure closer than 35 feet, BBW or the riverfront. Which is true, but in the calculation of density, does where do we draw Doesn't, the line? Yeah. Yeah, because there's a difference it's between a difference. putting it on the site and allowing the, right. the allowing uh, someone to count that buffer area as part of their de de developable parcel. Right. Um, yeah, just, I, I don't know what the answer to that is. Well, if you have open space, whether it's buildable or unbuildable, you know, in in a great quantity compared to what you're developing, even if that seems to be very dense, you 
still should be allowed to develop. You know, if you include all of the non-buildable area in the FAR, you get higher density, but you still get that open space. You can't build in it, but it's still yeah. there. Yeah. If you so get two really, 10 units versus four units, they still have to be outside of the jurisdiction. By r really, the, the, the reason why, the reason why wetlands are excluded from calculation of, uh, of density, just wetlands, is so that someone doesn't have, buy a parcel that's 85% wetlands and in, 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 in huge, you know, huge area of wetlands, and then get a massive density because they can, um, you know, they can cram all of that density onto the one little spot that's that's um, that's high and dry um, outside of that. I mean, that's really the that's the sort of the thought Logic. process of why you why you don't include wetlands themselves. It's not about it's not about where you. F you know, a, a sort of the more rational parcel where you're making sure that, that whatever density you have doesn't fit on the, you know, you don't put it on the bank or, you know, in the, in the, the buffer. Um, I mean, you don't want to impart apartment towers in the Great Cedar Swamp? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, that's the, I think that's the, that's what okay. you make sure you don't, you, you uh, don't I want to see in 1996, we made a community where I was, in urban planning where the, the seafront had moved. There was sediment and the beach moved. And some people said, well, I'm like 150 feet from the beach, the, you know, the winter, the winter line, whatever. And the, the state went and said, no, you gotta look at the aerial photos of 1952. That's where, they, well, that's oh, where the beach line is. Yeah. Yeah. Because whatever is after that, it's, it's still not buildable land. It should be, it's part of the natural resources of a community, yeah. whether it's sea, whether it's wetlands, whether it's natural forest, whether it's, you know, whatever, you know, a habitat, this should not be part of this calculation, I think. Now, if it is disturbed, as opposed to, uh, what, you know, what is disturbed is the other question. Or what you call redevelopment. I think, a, you know, Lind calls it like disturbed land or something of that sort. So that, I think that's where the gray area is. You could have disturbed land which is pervious or impervious. Who knows? Yeah, it sounds like you want to, in a redevelopment area, you'd like to add that, that land back, that disturbed mm -hmm. land back in. Um, but when we look at it from the other side, when it's, when it's pristine and it's bank, you don't want to have a buffer in front of it. So I'm not saying, I mean, I understand redevelopment, it's to agree. You have to, we're hoping there is some improvement in that area, so that's that's why we allow it. Uh, okay. Okay. There's a lot of work yeah. to do on that. What's that? There's a lot of work to do. Yeah. Alright. Okay. We have do you guys need a break? Yeah, it'd be nice. Okay, three minutes. <laughs> Seven minutes.